There have been tragic figures in every sport. Lou Gehrig in baseball, Brian Piccolo in football, countless others, men who have died before their times and who are grieved still. But more complicated is a story like that of Eric Chow, who once was the pitching ace of the 1984 National League champion Padres. Was his death last month a tragedy or merely a waste? Dan Locke looks at the life and death of Eric Chow. There's a great contradiction here. A highly intelligent, deeply religious man dies of a drug overdose. His best friends have no easy answers, but believe somewhere behind the smiling face was Eric Chow's own private psychological terror. There was just much more going on inside his heart, and that's where the real struggle was. During the mid-80s, Eric Chow was winning 15, 16 games a year. He had a sinker that dove for the dirt and drove the hitters mad. Yet even then, the complex nature of his personality could drive his own managers mad. Once, he had a no-hitter through four innings, then abruptly changed tactics. And he said it was, just, it was just too easy at that point to, to get him out. Chow frequently found himself in the eye of the storm. He was pitching in Cincinnati the night that Pete Rose broke Ty Cobb's record. And when he sat down on the mound during the celebration, it angered Cincinnati fans. We wasn't trying to be disrespectful to Pete Rose at all. You know, that was the Eric Chow thing to do. We ask, please, for a moment of silence. It was fitting, in a way, that this year on opening day, when the Padres decided to memorialize Chow's years in San Diego, they chose not to show him gripping a four-seam fastball, but his Gibson, as he played a jazzed-up version of Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Chow was an accomplished musician and a born-again Christian who rarely hung out with the guys. Instead, on the road, he went to museums and read books, developing a reputation as a locker room intellectual. There were times that I felt like I needed to get a, a dictionary. I had to pick out a few of the words. He wasn't into golf or fishing. Now he, he liked the guitar, and uh, again, he got involved in politics. When his teammates learned he was a member of the right-wing John Birch Society, he had some explaining to do. Some fans never understood. A lot of people associate the John Birch Society with racism. And Eric was definitely not a racist human being. But the charges of racism still hung in the air the next year at Wrigley Field when one of Shao's fastballs struck Andre Dawson in the face. The bench is empty. It was an ugly scene. It was a dangerous situation. You know, you got a crowd like that, a mob, and there's almost a lynching mob. You know, Eric was human. And he just couldn't understand why he was constantly being tested. And when I say that, he felt that God was being tested him throughout his life. But the greatest test was yet to come. By the spring of 92, Shaw had been through back surgery, a trade, and two disappointing seasons. And in the A's training camp, his behavior had become erratic. Then, one morning, he arrived with his hands cut up and bandaged, reportedly from climbing a barbed wire fence to escape from police. The A's put him on waiver. No one picked him up. The word spread. Drug. There was still was a lot of surprise uh, about his involvement. If he had come to the park and he was lied on something, we would have known. But I never saw it. The night that he died, he came to one of the seedy sections of downtown San Diego, where drugs are easy to find. He ingested large amounts of cocaine and heroin, which he then washed down with a six-pack of beer. He was in trouble, and he knew it, and he called for help. He was taken to a drug rehabilitation center, but it was too late. He thought he was going to beat it. Yes. Did he think he was going to beat it? Yes, he did. A month before he died, Shao checked himself into Rancho Labri, a drug treatment center in the hills east of San Diego. He was determined to get help. He was determined to get well. Tuesday, March 15th, Shao checked himself out and went home to see his wife. Jeremia, and Elizondo. It was just hours before his final binge, yet he seemed like the old Eric Chow. As a matter of fact, we, you know, we made an appointment to see each other Saturday at 1 o'clock. At 1 o'clock, I stood over his grave. I put a rose on his coffin and said goodbye. Dan Locke for ESPN. Of course, the Eric Chow story, that of a complicated man in what is sometimes a system that works against complicated men, is not the only tragedy from that 1984 San Diego Padre team. Ironically, the high moment of the whole franchise's history, certainly the context of what we've seen the last couple of years. If you know about the, the tragedy of, of Dave Jewett Trebecki losing his arm to cancer, another story that, that really did not hit home in the same way that this did. Perhaps Alan Wiggins died at age.
three years ago, I guess. And only one person from baseball attended the funeral. It's very sad. Yeah, all the members of that 1984 Padre team. Still to come on this hour-long Sports Center, when we return, who lit the firecracker on baseball's scoring explosion? We'll offer a few theories.